So let's let's start. I think. So I'm I'm Philippe Godard. I'm professor of pathology at the uh, University Paris East, uh, uh, University in, in 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 France, and I'm uh, very happy to to co-chair Jürgen Roland this uh, Red Talk uh, webinar, which will be given by uh, TACMAC, and I think it's not necessary to introduce too much uh, TAC because everybody should know him, but uh, Jürgen will summarize a bit uh, the, 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 the CV of, uh, of TAC. And it's a great pleasure also to be here because I, I had a chance to, to know TAC maybe 12 years ago and to work close to him and it will be certainly something fascinating. So Jürgen. We cannot hear you, uh, Jürgen. You are on mute. Ah, okay. Yeah, thank you, Philip. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Yeah. So, uh, good evening, also from my side. Um, my name is uh, Jürgen Ruland. I'm professor of laboratory medicine from the Technical University uh, of Munich, and uh, it's a great pleasure to um, introduce uh, Professor uh, Takmak. Um, as today's speaker of the uh, Red Talk series on lymphomas. I <coughs> also have the pleasure to know Tuck for quite some time. I uh, was a postdoc in his lab uh, some time ago, and Tuck was really a great mentor. So Tuck Mark is a professor of um, in the Department of Medical Biophysics and uh, Immunology at the University of Toronto, director of the Campbell Family Institute for Breast Cancer Research, and he is also a director of a newly funded uh, Center for Oncology and Immunology at the University of Hong Kong. As Philip mentioned already, um, it's very difficult to introduce Tuck because he is uh, internationally very well known for his pioneering work in genetics and molecular biology of cancer and the immune system. He was really driving the field uh, of immunology and cancer biology for almost 40 years and made numerous seminal contributions um, to our understanding. In 1984, um, he led the group that cloned uh, the human T cell receptor gene, which was the holy grail of immunology at the time, and provided basically the start of uh, the whole area of molecular T cell biology. Subsequently, he used um, very systematically uh, genetic modifications of mouse strains to identify multiple factors associated with immune function and cancer biology, including regulation of key molecules of programmed cell deaths, tumor regenesis such as P53 and P10. And he also discovered CTLA-4 as a key negative regulator of uh, T-cell activation that paved also the way for the development of checkpoint inhibitors. In addition to his great <laughs> academic success, it's also important to emphasize that Takmak uh, is also a entrepreneur. He co-founded uh, several um, biotech and pharmaceutical companies, including Agios and uh, Treadwell Therapeutics, focusing on the development of small molecules. And uh, just as an example, there are uh, two IDH2 inhibitors now FDA approved for the um, treatment of acute myeloid leukemias. I think he's very proud also um, about all his trainees because he's really an outstanding mentor. Numerous of his students and postdocs were very successful in uh, obtaining their own scientific careers, obtaining prestigious positions in academia and uh, industry worldwide. And it's no surprise that uh, Tuck was a recipient of uh, numerous uh, number of awards that are way too many to summarize here. Just as one example, his latest uh, award is uh, a recognition by the AACR, um, the Health Scholar Foundation Award for his extraordinary achievement in cancer research. So uh, it's uh, a great pleasure to introduce uh, Tuck Mack and he will talk tonight in his uh, Red Talk series on the meta 
metabolic regulation of hematological malignancies. Tuck the screen is yours. We cannot hear you, Tuck. You are on mute. You are on mute, I think, uh, uh, Tak. So probably you should press the button, microphone. Okay. Ah. All right. So. Yeah. Is it okay now? Yeah. Yeah. The 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 sound is okay. Now we need the yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So uh, thank you very much uh, for this kind invitation. Uh, I want to thank Philip and, of course, Jurgen. Uh, basically, we've been working as a team for many years, and uh, I cannot uh, actually express my gratitude for all they have done uh, to teach me about lymphomas and uh, other things. So the title of my talk uh, is uh, called Mikana, uh, which is Mikana is a Ujjabwi uh, Indian uh, name, uh, which means the path forward. Okay, so as I was saying that I've been interested in lymphoma, the first time I got interested in lymphoma was uh, Carl Lennart, uh, who uh, uh, gotten to know each other and he was trying to teach me what lymphoma was about and I was very excited uh, for now uh, 30 somewhat years and through this time I've been uh, very uh, lucky to have uh, a lot of uh, lymphoma doctors uh, uh, that have been in our laboratory. The first German was actually Lawrence Trumper and of course, you can see here, Jürgen Ruhlen, just uh, a couple of months ago, uh, we had a reunion. Our first uh, French um, uh, lymphoma doctor was Thierry Molina. And uh, through Thierry, uh, we've now known Christophe. And so uh, through uh, uh, Philip, uh, who actually introduced us uh, to uh, Francois Lamonet, uh, we are actually been working well together. And very more recently, we have Julie Lika, uh, another French postdoc uh, from Marseille. And uh, she uh, came from Marseille and she worked with Sophia Vizier and uh, Richard Tomasini, who were also postdocs in the lab uh, a few uh, years back. And uh, you can see that we're still uh, getting together uh, just uh, a couple of months ago in Marseille and uh, celebrating our own uh, continued quest for knowledge. Now I know a lot of the audience uh, are French here um, today. And uh, we also have a lot of French Canadian in Canada and many of them uh, we have also worked with. However, I think they are not particularly uh, identical to the French that I have known in France. Uh, for example, uh, very recently, as you all know, we were all going under, undergoing COVID situation and uh, uh, in Canada, it was shut down and nobody is allowed to leave the house except if you walk your dog. 
And so this French Canadian couple in Quebec decided that uh, she was also going to walk uh, her dog. And this time it turned out to be uh, her husband because uh, they also uh, needed some kind of a walk. And as it turned out, there was a $1,500 uh, uh, actually fine. And uh, the justice decided to fine uh, both of them. So you can see uh, Canada is a very uh, lovely place to be, not just science, uh, but we are also uh, very uh, humorous people uh, sometimes. Now, as you all know that um, there have been uh, through uh, the last 25 years, a lot of targeted drugs that have been uh, discovered. But as you can see, uh, many of these actually are against lymphomas and leukemias. But you can see also that over the years, the number uh, of these have been exhausted. And we now uh, know uh, from the sequencing of the whole human genome, there are limited, uh, particularly limited targets uh, to uh, for different kinds of cancers. So what are we going to do? So the idea now is that post chemotherapy and post anti oncogenes era, uh, with the new target will be to basically find the balances between the fire and the water. And these balances in cancer are exemplified by metabolic adaptations, uh, DNA repair, DNA damage, as well as uh, immune activate and homeostasis. Now, uh, metabolic uh, adaptation is actually a very interesting topic. It was probably uh, first um, exemplified uh, back almost 100 years ago. Uh, and in fact, in 1966, a group of Nobel laureates got together in uh, Lake uh, Constance, uh, actually very close to our recent um, reunion uh, in Germany uh, that Jürgen uh, uh, organized that, that we had a great time. And that time in 1966, it was declared at the end of three days that cancer is not caused by viruses, cancer is not caused by genes, but the cause of cancer is the replacement of the respiration of oxygen in the normal body cells by a fermentation of sugar. As you can see, this is very complicated biochemistry. And in essence, what uh, Otto Warburg uh, found uh, was that cancer cells, even in the presence of oxygen, uh, decided to use glycolysis and therefore accumulate lactate acid. So cancer uh, metabolism is very complicated, even more complicated than normal metabolism. And normal metabolism is driven by 2,700 genes and the number of metabolites are actually uh, almost uh, uh, really amazingly difficult to, to quantitate. So how do you actually get at this? So uh, almost 20 years ago, our laboratory decided that it is too complicated. Let's try to do genetics. And in the genetics, we use actually fly screen, Drosophila fly screen. We, with that time, we were interested in pathways that regulate cancer like the P53, uh, P10, uh, and the RAS and the PIF kinase pathway. So what happened was an MD PhD student, uh, Raymond Kim, and a German gastroenterologist, Malte Peters, decided to set up a fly screen. And you can see here, this is the eye of a Drosophila fly. When the P10 tumor suppressor gene was actually expressed, the eye got very small. And there is a Parkinson's disease gene called PAC7, which is a metabolism gene. 
And when you cross Pac-7 to P-10, it was able to rescue the P-10 phenotype. So that gave us actually the first sign in our laboratory that metabolism and cancer cross path. And then ultimately, more and more of these uh, evidences uh, were demonstrated. And here is the work of two graduate students, Isaac Harris and Christine Chow, who basically found that redox and oxidative stress initiate cancer uh, through a reiterating uh, on and off situation, allowing the cancer uh, to eventually uh, develop over a long period of time, but acquiring more and more uh, mutations and epigenetic changes that ultimately result in a cancer. And this is summarized uh, by an Italian postdoc uh, 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 Chiara Gorini and also uh, um, Harris that the idea of the metabolism of adaptation goes over a long period of time and reiterating uh, until there are so many different adaptations to so many different metabolic or uh, genetic changes. So the one I'm going to talk about is isocitrate dehydrogenase. Isocitrate dehydrogenase is one of those enzymes that is actually mutated, which is metabolic. And it represents the idea that oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes actually change metabolism and that in order to acquire more energy, different biosynthetic uh, uh, molecules. And in the case of redox, it's also a, a reiterating uh, but increasing amount of oxidative stress. And I would like to spend uh, most of my time talking about isocitrate dehydrogenase and uh, a metabolite uh, choline. Isocitrate dehydrogenase mutation was originally discovered by Bert Vogustin in the glioma situation. Tim Lay's laboratory discovered these mutations in AML. And I was very lucky uh, to collaborate with Philip uh, and uh, we defined the dis uh, discovery of an AITL, the isocitrate dehydrogenase. As you can see here, there are three different uh, um, uh, hot spots for mutations of isocitrate dehydrogenase, two in IDH, two in the mitochondria, one in IDH, one in the cytoplasm. You can see each one is quite distinct in the three different mutations that you can actually acquire uh, in the process of transformation. In the case of IDH1 and IDH2, which cause AML, uh, a Japanese uh, postdoc, uh, uh, Masato Sasaki, and a German um, neuropathologist, Christiane Knopp, uh, defined the changes in a mouse in a knock-in, which has a syndrome similar to myelodysplastic syndrome. And interestingly, these changes, both epigenetics and uh, also transcriptional, are very similar to patients with AML with the IDH mutation. But significantly, they were able to show also together with Agios, the pharmaceutical company, that these mutations represented a neomorphic uh, mutation. In other words, it is not a direct gain of function. It is not a direct loss of function. In fact, it takes the product of isocytic dehydrogenase, which is alpha ketoglutarate, and convert it to a metabolite which is capable of transforming cells and this is called an oncometabolite. So how does oncometabolite work? Oncometabolite works partly because the 2-hydroxyglutarate is very similar to alpha-ketoglutarate in its structure, 
And in so doing, it actually able uh, to modulate the alpha ketoglutarate functions and over AD enzymes, which involve transaminations, porohydroxylations, and epigenetic changes. As you can see, alpha ketoglutarate and TET1 and TET2 are in actually a sequence uh, on its way to convert 5-methylcytosine to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. And for that reason, you can see that TAT2 and IDH mutations actually do not overlap, uh, at either, even though TAT2 overlaps with almost every other mutation in AML. Similarly, IDH mutation will overlap with other mutations, but not with TAT2. However, these different mutations are very uh, 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 different uh, in, in even though they tend to be uh, very similar. And uh, the work of uh, Francois Lamonnier uh, was able to tell us that each of these mutations actually make, makes different degree of, of 2-hydroxyglutarate leading to different effects. And you can see here, a paper just uh, came out uh, with Jerome Fontaine, uh, a French Canadian postdoc from Montreal, that each of these mutations, uh, IDH1, R172, uh, R132, IDH2, R140, R172, and TET2, actually uh, have subtle changes uh, so that you can expect uh, these to be uh, quite different uh, pathologically, uh, especially uh, pathological in the AML situation. Now, together with Philippe Goulart's lab, uh, Franz Malamene uh, and uh, Rob Cairns in our laboratory uh, were instrumental in not showing that, not only showing the IDH mutation can be found in AITL, uh, but that they overlap uh, with each other significantly in about a third of the situation, even though they do not overlap in AML. The question, of course, is why? Well, it turned out that this is the work of Julie Leaker. And what Julie did was actually to make a, a mouse in which the T cells are expressing IDH2 mutations as an, an addition to the TAT2 mutations. And she found something very, very interesting. What she found was that these mutations, either IDH2 alone or IDH uh, uh, TAT2 alone, were very different uh, with the, uh, the, the, the T cells, which could, would have both mutations of IDH2 and TAT2. There, there are certain genes that were up certain genes they were down and uh, uh, certain other genes uh, there are uh, no that much difference. But what was interesting was that this mutation of the T cells were able to actually coerce the B cells uh, in the germinal center setting to cross talk with it and create a microenvironment modulation, which actually increased the survival of not only the T cells, but also the B cells and allow them to prolif proliferate and in some cases allow them to differentiate. This uh, is exemplified in a paper just appeared uh, a month ago uh, in collaboration with Francois Lamonet and Philippe Goulart. What they found uh, basically what the mutations of TAT2 and IDH in the T cells was able to upregulate ICOS, upregulate PD-1, uh, but more importantly, it downregulate fast. On the B cells, CD38 and CD40 and CD86 are up, but you have this increased crosstalk between the T and B cells in a, in a sem manner similar to a germinal center, but you have a decrease in the fast ligand expression, leading to decrease in apoptosis. The summation of this 
is that the spleen weight is up, angiogenesis is up, and then eventually the mouse develop cancer. And in some cases, not only is the T cell uh, 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 lymphoma, but there is B cell lymphoma that came out of this. So this is what Julie actually had very nicely said. It's like shaking hands uh, with the devil. Luckily and serendipitously, these, as Jürgen was saying, these inhibitors had some uh, beneficial activities in, a, in AML, as you can see here in this particular slide, in the probability of survival in AML. It's also had a phase three positive clinical trial and chloride uh, uh, carcinoma. And then a, a more recently, there is some sign of activity in glioma, as you can see here in this case, uh, that uh, the, 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 the whole group of people uh, which are now uh, carrying out the, the, the clinical trials from Agios and now to Sevier, a French company. And you can see that two different compounds are able to elicit some kind of responses. And uh, they declared that at least at the, the level of phase two, uh, they have uh, reached their uh, uh, end point and hopefully there will be more progress down the road. Now, interestingly, as you can see here, that these IDH mutations also affect DNA repair by downregulating ATM uh, in the IDH situation, but not in the TEP2 situation. So this reminds us that the second uh, important uh, uh, balancing of the fire and water is the genomic instability that the DNA uh, repair and DNA damage is actually uh, being caused. Now, I just want to very quickly run by uh, the, the idea that uh, genomic instability is found in cancer, but the idea uh, that has now been introduced by topoisomerases and POP inhibitors is that we can create drugs that would even elicit further, more severe uh, genomic instability, leading to even more uh, cell cycle arrest and maybe to elicit uh, apoptosis. And along the same line, we discovered about a dozen years ago, a couple of targets. One is PLK4 in central duplications, as you can see here, uh, one to two to one, in a normal cell, but then in cancer cells, you have multiple centrioles, and the, the other enzyme is TTK uh, in a spindle assembly checkpoint, as you can see here, that uh, these uh, spindles are actually in some cases uh, very disorganized, and the amount of these enzymes can be up from one log to two logs, creating a potential for these targets uh, to have a good therapeutic index. And in this context, uh, the work of Desha Skan, a graduate student in the lab now, uh, a medical oncologist in, uh, and, and running his own lab, was able to show that these enzymes, not only are they up, but they are actually downstream of the cyclin E CDK2. And these uh, inhibitors that we have been, we have made uh, uh, almost uh, uh, eight or nine years ago uh, have some activities here. You can see PLK4 creating a central duplication uh, uh, situation where there are multiple centrioles. This particular compound is now in phase two and FDA fast tracked. And the second compound is also FDA fast tracked and it's also in phase two, and this one is a spindle assembly checkpoint. As you can see here, some of these uh, represents uh, uh, some activities found in monotherapy and ER positive HER2 minus breast cancer, as you can see here, 
that uh, after 13 cycles or after two cycles, you can actually um, see some activities uh, that are uh, uh, notable. And the, the um, bio, biomarkers appear to be one of them is the RB deletion. Now, why I am introducing this to you is that it also has some leukemia and lymphoma activity. It's shown here in P53 complex karyotype uh, AML. And the work of Anish Yunus uh, uh, at Memorial, uh, a, a, a good friend of many of yours, and now in AstraZeneca, is also has a paper in press showing that these compounds have uh, significant activities against certain lymphomas, uh, particularly that of mental cell lymphomas. Um, interestingly, these uh, compounds can also elicit uh, in different situations some kind of activation of the uh, immunogenicity, uh, as can shown here, uh, a paper by in, in Dana Farber and David Barbie's group and in Hong Kong in, in, in Carmen Wong's group for liver cancer and in lung cancer. And the idea is that these compounds are able to trigger uh, an immune uh, a response against the tumor and the postulated uh, activity is in fact that uh, they activate CGAS and then the sting pathway leading uh, to the activation of uh, interferon as well as TNF and IL-6 and IL-1. So this actually is uh, uh, potentially interesting, especially through the work of Anas Yunus in AstraZeneca now. I'm gonna end uh, with the uh, talk on the immune uh, 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 immunotherapy and the immune activate and, and homeostasis. Uh, as you can see, and has been really uh, kind been uh, stressed to many of us that the tumor microenvironment is actually very, very complicated. And in fact, uh, the immune checkpoint blockade has now uh, been combined in almost 2000 different clinical trials to try to understand how to enhance the immune response against uh, the tumors uh, without a, a, a toxicity uh, that is too significant uh, to uh, be able to stop immunotherapy in, in the patients. Uh, it's very complicated. I don't want to get involved in it. Many of you know this much better, more than I do, uh, but I can tell you that there are certain things that are worth noting. One is that uh, T cells get exhausted after a lot of activities, especially when they're high affinity T cell receptors against peptide HLA. And you can see here that the work done uh, over 10 years ago in our laboratory that interleukin-7 is able to enhance an immune response against tumors uh, significantly uh, over a long period of time. Uh, one of the also very interesting properties that a lot of pathologists have seen over the years is that in many cases, the tumor seem to be uh, insulated from the immune response by either a, 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 a war of macrophages or blood vessels that prevent T cells from escaping into the tumor microenvironment, as you can see uh, in some of these situations. So actually this brings me to a very interesting uh, concept that our laboratory uh, have been recently uh, very lucky uh, to be working on uh, with the help of, of uh, Kevin Tracy, uh, a, a surgeon in New York. And this reminds me of a, a quote of Richard Feynman, who said that, I would rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. And this begins uh, over 170 years ago, that couple of German anatomists and surgeons 
were able to show that in dogs and even in decapitated human, that when they stimulate the nerves of the spleen, that the spleen moved, that the, the nerve leading to the spleen when it's stimulated, the, 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 the spleen actually moved, suggesting that there is actually a connection between the neuronal system and the immune system, which has been uh, kind of a topic of, of, of controversy uh, for almost uh, 100 years. But also many people have been uh, connecting nerves, particularly the autonomic connections of nerves. Now, autonomic connections of nerves, is, 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 as many of you know, or all of you know, is actually regulated by sympathetic nerves, which is a fight and flight, which leads to an increased acceleration of the heart, the lung, etc., And it is mediated by a, a neurotransmitter, norepinephrine. Parasympathetic nerves, on the other hand, is a rest and digest. This is mediated by the parasympathetic nerves through the secretion of acetylcholine. So in other words, Wagner and Hanley, 170 years ago, when they stimulated the nerve of the spleen, they saw the spleen moved. And this, since they are the, 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 the vagal nerves going into the spleen, they should see acetylcholine being made. And in fact, acetylcholine was found in the spleen back in 1929, where Dale and Dudley found acetylcholine. Moreover, in 1960, Brandon and Rand stimulated the nerve and found even more acetylcholine. So this created a situation which was very exciting. But the, the, the situation became more uh, onerous when it was found that it was not the parasympathetic nerve that are in the immune organs, but they are actually the sympathetic nerves because these you can see here, the lymph nodes at pious patch, thymus, and the spleen is stained mainly by tyrosine hydroxylase, which is a marker for norepinephrine, which is a marker for sympathetic nerves. So the finding of acetylcholine is paradoxical since they are made by parasympathetic nerves, but the spleens and the lymphoid organs have sympathetic nerves. So what was discovered eventually was that the vagal nerve made a switch to the splenic nerve, which makes norepinephrine. And since norepinephrine is there, then who is making the acetylcholine? What cells? So then Kevin Tracy and our laboratory, his laboratory, postulated that there are cells that are relaying in, in this, this particular uh, message. And this turned out to be uh, the uh, relay was actually done uh, through the immune system, through the uh, uh, sympathetic nerves into the parasympathetic nerve. And the way it was done uh, by Kevin Tracy uh, and, and our laboratory a dozen years ago is to use the acetylcholine transferase GFP, which would then mark a green cell that makes GFP uh, that would be the cell that also makes acetylcholine. And it was clear that about 1% of the T cells and about 1% of the B cells makes acetylcholine. In the T cells, almost any kind of T cells can actually make it. In the B cells, they're mainly marginosome and follicular B cells. So this is just 1%, not that significant. However, when Maureen Cox, a American postdoctoral fellow came to the laboratory, when she infected a mouse with this virus, an LCMV, she found that there was a tremendous increase 
in the number of cells that can now make acetylcholine. And basically, what would be the function of this? So she then deleted the enzyme chat in T cells alone by a CD4 cre deleting the enzyme chat. Of course, we cannot delete chat in all them, all the cells in the mouse because uh, they are basically uh, used in a lot of parasympathetic nerves and other uh, neuronal transmission. What was important was that when she deleted the acetylcholine transferase, that the mouse can now no longer uh, clear the virus without the use of acetylcholine transferase and thereby I, uh, uh, by, by uh, reference to the acetylcholine being made. With the acetylcholine transferase, the virus is cleared uh, within a month or so. What are the mechanisms? There are many different mechanisms I cannot get involved in, but one of which is actually the dilation of the blood vessels. As you can see, without acetylcholine transferase, the dilation of blood vessels is much more limited than if you have acetylcholine transferase. And not only can you find this in one organ, but every organ in your body, that these viruses outside are not cleared because the T cells cannot manage to escape from the blood vessels that they are trapped in. And the idea uh, uh, mechanistically is that the T cells actually brings acetylcholine directly to the endothelial cells, leading to this smooth muscle cells contraction and therefore uh, allowing uh, the expansion uh, of the, uh, the blood vessels for the T cell to escape. Now, there are going to be many, many different uh, implications to this particular connection between the brain and the immune system leading to the immune cells, T and B cells, uh, making acetylcholine. But I have no time to describe it. We are very excited about pursuing this. Along this line, in collaboration with Peter Olofsson, we're able to show that the acetylcholine on the T cells are able to change the blood vessels, uh, blood pressure uh, of the, uh, the mice. And in human, a paper just appeared two weeks ago that uh, their laboratory in Sweden was able to show that the survival of patients with severe circulatory failure correlate to the frequency of the chat positive uh, CD4 T cells, suggesting in fact that even in human, not just in a mouse, we are seeing a pathophysiological uh, uh, differences with and without the acetylcholine made by T cells uh, 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 on their own. Now, uh, a very completely unexpected is the finding uh, with our clinicians in our laboratory in a paper just appeared about three months ago that the amount of choline in the serum of the patients actually um, able to um, predict the ability uh, of the patients to mount in immunotherapy a response against the tumor. In high choline, the survival is significantly higher than the low choline uh, patients uh, in the serum. I cannot and cannot tell you what it is about now, but it's quite intriguing uh, to speculate what it may be. Now, reason why I share this data with you is this particularly very intriguing data. We shown in uh, 2001, uh, Akira Suzuki, a Japanese postdoc in the laboratory, that deleting P10 in, in, in lymphoid cells can create lymphomas. As you can see here, the mouse is succumbing to lymphoma. But what Maureen Cox had shown uh, uh, before she left the laboratory, set up her own lab back in the US, is that in addition to the P10, with one allele of the uh, acetylcholine transferase deleted, 
the mouse has a much severe uh, uh, disease. And if you delete pull both allele of CHAT, meaning that they would now even make less acetylcholine, the ability to form a lymphoma is uh, even further enhanced. Now, I'm going to end with a story which is pertinent to many of you because of CAR T. And the idea is let's go back to where it started. Where it started is the T cell receptor. The T cell receptor has, of course, ability to recognize peptide on an HLA class one or class two. In the case of CAR T, uh, the work of Carl June, Michelle Satterline, and others, they have um, uh, uh, switched an antibody to the outside with the T cell receptor on the inside. And this way, it will recognize CD19, CD20, CD22, and BCM8. Now, this is, of course, been very, very successful. As you can see here, it's now been approved for leukemia and lymphoma. And a paper came out in the Oakland Journal about six months ago that these patients that were treated, some of them, a few lucky ones, had now uh, 10 years uh, past uh, are still uh, in some kind of remission or at least uh, uh, have the uh, ability to fight off a disease at uh, some on some level uh, to be still uh, surviving. Now, the T cell uh, receptor uh, are different from CAR T. It's different. First, it is recognized as peptide HLA, not a surface molecule. Second, it requires a much, much, much fewer number of molecules, making it potentially very sensitive than compared to CAR T, which requires over a thousand molecules. The disadvantage or advantages that we do not know is that they actually have uh, a uh, much lower affinity uh, to the peptide HLA by the T cell receptor, whereas CAR T, they are higher. Potentially, uh, we can target not only solid, uh, but also liquid. And you can see here a very important point is this particular synapse. Since the T cell receptor, after recognizing uh, in an in, uh, uh, antigen presenting cell, the peptide and NHLA, just a few molecules, this whole membrane or big part of the membrane together with the antigen presenting cells will form the synapse. Formation of the synapse is a very important. Now, first, what is the reason for studying this? As you can see here, the work of Rarura Badan in solid tumors, as you can see in prostate cancer, breast cancer, uh, uh, glioblastoma, there is extensive loss of HLA, both somatically and allele-specific uh, 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 loss. So this suggests, uh, together with the fact that when there is a loss, the prognosis is, is worse, that there is immune uh, surveillance going on and that the immune evasion of the tumor cells is to lose the HLA so they can lose the uh, expression of the peptide on the cell surface for the T cells to survey. In DLBCL, the work of Ricardo Della Ferreira here is even more dramatic. Only one quarter of the DLBCL and maintain both copies of both HLA class one and class two. The rest of them have either lost class one and class two HRA to all that they have uh, lost one or the other. And the loss of HRA class one can be seen here. Uh, as in the case of particular kind of diffuse large B cell lymphoma called MCD, yeah, you guys much better than I know as MYD88 CD79B, you can see here, they have a preferential loss 
of HLA class 1b, suggesting that this HLA class 1b may be loading particular antigens that the T cells would rather see them and kill them before they de develop any further. And it's not particularly surprising because MCD, as has been taught to me by many of you, is very much involved in a situation where the T cells interact with the B cell lymphoma in a very intimate way. Similarly, but on the other uh, uh, reflection of the work of Julie Leaker, uh, who showed that in the case of T cell lymphoma, there is a prominent B cell uh, interaction. Uh, and in this case, there is a B cell lymphoma with a prominent T cell uh, in involvement. And what are the T cells seeing that is probably not very clear. A lot of investigators and companies prefer to say what they are, they are actually uh, seeing, uh, that mutant DNA, uh, they call uh, neoantigens, but it is not clear that any of the other uh, 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 antigens that are viral, in the case of lymphoma, it would be one evidence of which it would be EBV, differentiation antigens like GP100, which has actually been approved by FDA uh, in uveal melanoma in the treatment of a T cell receptor against GP100 in the context of, of HRAA201. And there are cancer testes antigens and overexpressed antigens. Here is another example of a, a sinifial sarcoma uh, from the company up to immune uh, which uh, they were able to treat with a T cell receptor against an NYESO1 peptide. And also in this case, the work of Christian Henricks in, 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 in New Jersey, in Rutgers. This is a T cell receptor uh, recognizing the E7 protein of the human papillomavirus loaded again on HRA0201. Now, for many of you who are interested, there are cancer testes antigens in diffuse large B cell lymphomas, as you can see here. If you find one that is here and not found expressed in normal cells, you will have a good chance of having a good start. Now, of course, one cannot just think of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. In your case here, just even myeloma, diffuse large B cell lymphomas, AML, they appear to share some uh, 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 antigens, potential antigens, and even some of these can be shared with a wider range of even solid tumors that are uh, being expressed. So that creates an opportunity for us to be greedy and find T cell receptors that can treat multiple diseases. Now, how do you move beyond that? This is the work of a, a genius uh, biochemist who actually is a clinician by training, Naoto Hirano in, in, in Toronto, where his laboratory is to affinity maturate not only just the HRA-A201, but 40 HRA class one, 15 HRA class two, that over the last 10 years, creating a situation where the T cell receptor can recognize the peptide and the HLA in a very, very efficient way, as much as two to three locks more increase in avidity, forming a more readily uh, 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 functional synapse and thereby allowing the T cells to kill. Now, this has been now done uh, for HLA uh, in his laboratory that can cover a very large uh, percentage of uh, Asians, Europeans, uh, and Africans. By doing that, I'm just uh, finishing up, they can now go beyond HLA-A201, his HLA-B18, 
HLA B40, and this is uh, a MAT1 protein. This is NYESO1, and through overlapping peptides, you can find the T cell receptor that can pick up these peptides and define their exact amino acid that is loaded on these peptides. And by doing that, uh, uh, his laboratory is able to pick up T cell receptors against multiple uh, 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 proteins like MHH3, WT1, NYESO1. And by doing that, not only in class two, as shown here by D DP4, you can do this uh, in, in class one. And in this case, it's APNA1, which is of course an EVBV protein. Now, my final slide is very important. We have to make sure that this cancer antigen has to be expressed in the vast, vast, vast majority of the cancer cells. As you can see here, shown here, the cancer cells that are actually uh, uh, marked in pink color. And at the same time, this particular antigen is also found in the cancer cell alone. And even if you can see here, there are three dots right here, and there are three dots right here. So I think <clears throat> with this opportunity, we may be able to go back to lymphomas and other cancers, some antigens that can, we can target beyond CAR T and allow us to actually uh, have a better chance of treating our patients. I'm going to end by saying that I want to quote this African proverb that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I would love to be able to collaborate with, uh, with many of you to advance the field, increase our understanding. And I can, I'm proud, as Jürgen was saying, that over the last 30 some odd years, our laboratory had uh, the, uh, the, 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 the fortune and the good luck and gratitude to be able to work with uh, many Europeans from France, from Germany, from Spain, as well as from Asia and North America. In our sky, you are the brightest star. Without your light, it is dark like tar. This is a, uh, a, a reunion that uh, we had uh, a couple of months ago that Jürgen uh, very kindly organized. You can see that is Jürgen. There is, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, uh, Lawrence Trumper, and many of them had went on to do, and this is Francois Lamonet here, uh, uh, to do, as Jürgen said, uh, very uh, important work. Jürgen, for example, and Klaus Pfeffer uh, had won the top prize, a German scientist uh, in separate years. And, uh, and of course, um, Lawrence is a, as many of you know, is a very prominent lymphoma uh, clinical trial uh, doctor in Göttingen. So these, I want to end by uh, thanking uh, many of the people that have been uh, making this talk possible, Philip Goulard, Francois Lamonnier, of course, uh, and then uh, many of the other people, Julie Leaker here, uh, uh, Jerome Fontaine, and many of the other people in this field. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tak, for this uh, outstanding uh, lecture. Very comprehensive. You brought an, a huge overview on the uh, processes leading to cancer, going from metabolisms to gene to immunology and so on. So it, it opens a lot of uh, different path and I think uh, uh, maybe there might be question from the audience or maybe someone uh, who want to to start maybe I have a, a, a question relative to to your last part on the 
the, the CAR T against uh, cancer antigens, which is, of course, something which is very promising at the therapeutic level. So I wanted to know how, maybe you, I, I didn't catch it, but how we can uh, get uh, specific cancer antigens for, for a specific cancer. I mean, which... So here uh, are these cancer testes antigens that are expressed in DLPCL. You can see here MHA9B uh, and many of these other ones here. So um, you would like to, and these are the normal tissues. So you want to find something that is very little expressed in normal tissues. Yes. But expressed in lymphomas. Uh, so you can find these uh, potential targets. And uh, you can actually do better because this is DLBCL. These are the these these targets are these ones here. You can see here. And the idea is to find in myeloma uh, uh, some that overlap uh, with these here and in AML. And that way, uh, these could be uh, used as an antigen. Now, uh, we, to confirm that, uh, you can see here, uh, these are the cancer cells. Uh, this is actually myeloma. Uh, and and uh, because these are, uh, these are, uh, these are uh, B cell receptors that are, that are unique uh, gene rearrangements. And, and this is one of those antigens that we, I just uh, uh, possibly described. So that means this is present in cancer and uh, uh, cancer cells and the antigen has this. So this would be a good candidate for you to, to make a T cell receptor against this particular peptide uh, uh, and uh, of course, uh, we have to take into consideration the particular HLA uh, that is being uh, that the patient has. Thank you. So with this, you can fish out from the patient uh, T cell receptors that are in their tumors that are aimed at killing these. Jürgen, you want? Yeah, th thank you, Tuck, for this really fascinating um, overview of this, all this amazing work. I have uh, two related questions to the acetylcholine. I mean, uh, you, you, you clearly showed that uh, the acetylcholine in the B cells also affects this lymphomagenesis or in the T cells. Do you have already ideas what the mechanism is? And the second, I mean, since acetylcholine controls the homing of these T cells during the LCMB infection, um, can you also use this to modify CAR T cells and change their biological behavior? Mm -hmm. uh, so for your first question is, anyone who wants to come to work, uh, this particular slide is very clear. If the lymphocyte is missing, acetylcholine, I do not know whether it is intrinsic or extrinsic. There is an enhanced lymphomagenesis for the mouse to die. That, the mechanism which I don't know. Now, in the, in the, in the second situation, it is a lot more complicated. It turns out that every subset of T cells, Th1, Th2, Th17, Trex, they all make acetylcholine for a different reason. Uh, and, uh, but uh, that also requires a, a lot more studies. Thank you. 
So there is a question in the chat. Um, maybe I read it. It's from uh, Bertrand Nadel. He asked you, Tuck, uh, regarding T cell engineering, would you anchor the TCR with its peptide? And how do you, how to do it? And if so, would it be stable? So can you anchor the TCR with its peptide? Mm -hmm. uh, the peptide is the peptide is loaded on the HLA. And so the T cell receptor, the HLA, and it is, it is it, it, the peptide loaded HLA comes from inside the cell uh, uh, through uh, a whole bunch of proteins in the proteosomes and tap. So this is completely loaded and I cannot, we cannot use a T cell receptor with a peptide uh, uh, attached to the T cell receptor. We have to find the T cell receptor that uh, would recognize the peptide and the HLA. Maybe uh, uh, another question. I, when listening to your first, the first part of your talk, it appears clear that for example, IDH2, IDH, at least is involved in different tumors that have nothing to, to see each other. And um, it appears that they probably, uh, IDH, the two, the, I mean, the oncometabolite, the two AG, has different function uh, depending on the cell type or how do you see that? I mean, the, the, how the, even in the hematologic, uh, among neo, ne, hematologic neoplasms, you see that uh, in, uh, in T-cell lymphoma where IGH2 is mutated, it's always with T2, whereas in AML, it's usually mutually exclusive, but in glioma or glioblastoma, it's different, etc. So how do you see the, the function of the metabolite? Is it, is it depending or changing the metabolism depending on the cell type or? Yeah, uh, so, so actually Francois Lamonet uh, uh, you know, yes. ha already uh, uh, about four years ago uh, uh, defined that each one of these mutations uh, make a different level of 2-hydroxyglutarate. And uh, Jerome Fortin's work showed that in AML, each one of these have a different profile. So within one disease, different level of 2-hydroxyglutarate will affect different sets of genes expressed. Uh, as a result of changes to epigenetics or, 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 or metabolism. And one could um, infer that this change of 2-hydroxyglutarate blocking alpha-ketoglutarate functions as a, a alpha-ketoglutarate, uh, you know, transamination or polyhydroxylation epigenetic changes. So one could say this is this could affect any one of these, even within one disease. And my guess would be that if you go to the different diseases, and you will even uh, be made more complicated, uh, more than I can even speculate. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and I, I don't think I can answer your question, except to say that that it is going to be very complicated. This probably explains why the, the 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 inhibitors. I mean the uh, inhibitors in clinical trial may have different uh, efficacy depending on the on the context and on, on the disease. Yeah. Um, has anybody tried AITL? I think there has been a few cases that have been, a few patients that have been treated, but so far it's not published. 
and I don't know exactly. You might know better than us. No, I don't know. I, I, I would imagine it's going to be very difficult for AITL because the, the, the R172, which is this mutation AITL, makes really like 50 to 100 times more 2-hydroxyglutarate than these other two. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions from the audience or on the chat? I don't see other questions. We, 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 uh, if not, I mean, Jorgen, do you have a maybe one final question um, in your metabolic um, reprogramming situations? Do, do you also see links between glycolysis and epigenetics in your lymphoma systems? I don't know. <laughs> is is Francois uh, on on the on the phone? He he may be able to answer this better than me. Because he and Julie uh, looked at that data much more. Um, I think I think it's 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 in the paper. I think that there are a, a lot of correlations. I'm not sure that there are direct. Um, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this uh, outstanding uh, lecture. I think you brought uh, an overview of all, uh, I mean, different processes going from uh, cell biology and to, to, to therapies and uh, new new ideas, new concepts. So it's, uh, it's always fascinating. And I wish to thank uh, everyone for being there tonight. And uh, especially, uh, of course, uh, wish to thank uh, my co-chair Jürgen and uh, you, Tak, for this uh, uh, this uh, nice talk. Thank you very much, and thank hope you to see much. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, thank you, Tak. Sir. Thanks, Philip. Um, hope to see you soon. Yeah. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye-bye, I think.